right, everyone. Hello, good evening, and welcome. You are joining us for a poetry panel entitled Be I'm Expecting You, Dialogues with the Non-Human. And we're here on the third day of our Tell It Slant Poetry Festival at the Emily Dickinson Museum. We are so delighted to be welcoming participants from all over the world this week. And uh, we would love to know where you are coming from tonight. So please feel free to hop into the chat now and let us know where you are. Um, I'm Brooke Steinhauser. I'm the Senior Director of Programming at the Emily Dickinson Museum. It's my pleasure to be with you tonight and to be with these four amazing poets who are going to explore Dickinson's and other poems that put us in conversation with non-human creatures of the world around us. And we invite your participation through the chat space, but also through the Q&A function. So there's gonna be a time at the end set aside for you to be able to pitch your questions to these poets. Um, and you can do so by going to your toolbar, finding the Q&A bubble, and you can enter your questions there. We're gonna to be together uh, for about 90 minutes. You can enter questions at any point this evening into the Q&A. So now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's poet. First up, uh, I'm going to introduce Carolina Ebed, who is a multimedia poet born in New Jersey to Palestinian and Cuban parents. She is the author of You Ask Me to Talk About the Interior, and the chapbook Dower Wonder, and many digital experiments. And she edits poetry at the Rumpus and Visible Binary, and now through 2025, she's the Bonderman Assistant Professor of Poetry at Brown University. We'll be putting links to all these poets' websites in the chat as well. We encourage you to go learn more about them and their work. So uh, next up, I'm gonna introduce Julia Get. Oh, and I should mention, Carolina is joining us from Providence, Rhode Island. And next up, I'll introduce Julia Gez, who's joining us from Houston, Texas, and is a writer and translator based in the city of New York. The Certain Body is her second collection of poetry written while she was recovering from COVID in the spring of 2020. For her poetry, fiction, and translations, she's been awarded the Discovery Boston Review Prize, a Fulbright Fellowship, the John Frederick Nims Memorial Prize in Translation, and a Translation Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. She teaches creative writing at NYU and Rutgers. Next up, I'll introduce Anna VQ Ross, who is the author of four collections of poetry, most recently, Flutter Kick, which won the Benjamin Saltman Poetry Award and the Julia Ward Howe Award in Poetry, and was named a 2023 Best New Poetry Book by the New York Public Library. The recipient of fellowships from Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Fulbright Foundation, and Sewanee Writers Conference, Anna teaches creative writing at Tufts University and lives in Boston, where she raises chickens. Maybe we'll hear some more about those chickens tonight. Dialogues with the non-human chickens. Um, and finally, we will be uh, hearing from Tess Taylor. Actually, we're going to hear from Tess Taylor first, um, with a body of work who, that deals with place, ecology, memory, and cultural reckoning. She has published five celebrated poetry collections, The Misremembered World, the Forage House, Last West, Road Songs for Dorothea Lang, Work and Days, and Rift Zone. In 2023, she published the poetry anthology Leaning Toward Light, Poems for Gardens and the Hands that Tend Them, a collection of contemporary gardening poems for an era of climate crisis. And I can tell you that book got me through last winter, Tess. <laughs> um, and you can head to her website to find out more about her as well. So poets, thank you all for being here tonight. And now I'm going to hand it over to you, Tess, to tell us what's in store for this evening. Um, Brooke, thank you so much. And one of the things that's so wonderful about the Emily Dickinson House doing um, such phenomenal programming is the chance for us all to dig deep into Dickinson and think about how much she touches our lives right now. Um, when the chance to propose a panel came together, um, these four fabulous poets, who are some of my favorite poets working today, and I discussed the idea that um, in the lyric poem, in poetry that ch charges us up, there's often a desire to speak across boundaries and across, especially across into conversations that we don't get to have in our normal life. So for instance, if I could say, will you mail this letter? And you say, yes, that might not be a poem, 
But if I said, will you mail this letter in a mailbox at the bottom of the sea? We might be talking. We might be on track for a poem. And as it happened, Emily Dickinson is somebody who speaks across boundaries all the time. And one of the boundaries that she speaks across is boundaries between the human and non-human. And of course, she speaks across the boundaries of the living and the dead, but she also has such a wonderful way of befriending and mourning and grieving for and caring about the non-human world in her poems, which is, of course, something we need to learn to do more and that we are always living with in this moment, um, trying to find language that bridges us into our relationship with the non-human world that we are called the steward in this urgent moment. So um, it turns out poetry gives us tools for building those bridges, and Emily Dickinson gives us those tools in spades. And so What's going to happen tonight is that four poets, four extraordinary poets, are going to each take you through one Emily Dickinson poem, and they're going to talk about how it converses with the non-human world, and also they're going to perhaps give you a prompt so that you can think about, in a creative way, how you might take some of the essence of that poem and translate it into your own writing practice, and maybe begin a meaningful conversation with the non-human world yourself. Um, so it's kind of the best of both worlds. There's like a little bit of um, of close reading, a little bit maybe of um, academic ruminating. And then there's sort of some question about what would this be like to take into um, your own daydreaming, your own writing, your own poeming. And um, so each of us are gonna do this for about 12 minutes each. At the end of the conversation, um, at the end of our all conversation, there's going to be a chance for Q&A. Um, and I think we're going in something like reverse alphabetical order. But in any case, I'm going first. <laughs> so um, so that's just the lay of the land for the evening. Um, you'll hear from each of us about one poem. And hopefully that poem will be a window into even more poems. Um, and I believe that the poem that I started with and want to read closely is a very short poem. It's, I didn't realize until I looked it up again how late in Emily Dickinson's life it comes. Um, it is 1779 in the undated pile. I guess we don't really know when it comes, but it's at the far back of the book. And um, it's a little bit of a mysterious poem then in its in this undated section. Um, but it's one of my favorites and it's one that I can take in my back pocket kind of everywhere. And I find that I do. Um, it says, to make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee, a clover and a bee and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. I'm just going to read it again because there's time to read five lines. There's always time to read five lines of poetry. That's the beautiful thing about poetry. You can change your day in five lines and you have time for that. To make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee, one clover and a bee and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. So I wanted to start by making some noticings about this poem. Um, one of the things that I notice is that it's a poem about making. It's actually kind of a how-to poem, which is an interesting genre of poetry. Um, Another poem that might be known as a how-to poem is a long poem by Virgil called The Georgics. It goes on and on for four books telling you how to farm, how to build a plow, how to um, take care of your bees, how and when you should plant peas and how and when you should plant corn. That's a very practical Georgic. But this is a really interesting Georgic to make a prairie. It takes a clover and one bee. And suddenly we're off of like the Virgilian landscape of practical wisdom and into something that has to do with economy 
it has to do with shrinking down into um i think what wallace stevens might, might what, what might have once said is what suffices a quality of of what is the basic what is the most the how can the vast thing be condensed into this small space um in doing that shrinking Emily Dickinson is using a figure of speech that's kind of fun. It's called metonymy, part for the whole. Um, how can one part stand in for the whole? This is her question. How can one little piece make the whole feel as if it's present, make it reverberate? Um, sometimes when I have that feeling in my heart as a poem might be erupting in me. I call that the iceberg feeling that there's like, I can see the top of something and I know that underneath there's something much bigger. And it's kind of a beautiful, um, that condensation of experience, I think is something we, we may all feel at times in our life. This one person is all the people. This one tree is every forest. In, in it, I can, in, through this small thing, I can glimpse the wider whole. And um, that's metonymy for you. So um, anyway, the idea that the way that we have a conversation with the non-human is through this poem is really fascinating to me. It's not a poem of direct address the way the I'm expecting you is. It doesn't say, hey, I'm going to talk to you directly. Instead, this is a poem that proposes that there's a different scale at which we can have a conversation. And that scale is through this thing called reverie and also through this idea of condensing something large into something small. So first we have this prairie that's really vast and then we have it shrunk down into something so small that we can see it. And then we have the idea that this conversation can be had through almost a daydream of the heart, that the daydream of the heart allows the conversation with the bee and then with the clover and then outward into the wider whole. I love this. I love this idea that basically we start to need to have the first place that we need to have the conversation is, is in our heart, in our heart, beginning to hold first the bee and then the clover might let us imagine the prairie. I had a profound experience the other week. I was in um, Cincinnati, Ohio, giving a reading at a university that was mostly surrounded by lawn. It was sort of a too hot day that everybody was talking about a drought, waiting for rain, a little uneasy overheat at the end of the summer. And at the edge of this university, which was mostly lawn, somebody had made a tiny rewilded strip of meadow. And on the meadow, there were hollyhocks and goldenrod and a lot of milkweed with its funny little thorns just about to explode. And there were so many birds as if every single bird in the entire region was like, here's just one place I can live that's not a lawn or a parking lot. I really want to be here. And I went and I we were doing poem writing. So my class read, wrote poems to nature and they all sat around this tiny little patch of rewilded meadow. And I thought again about this idea, reverie alone will do if bees are few. And of course, we know that bees are few. So I think the question of this poem is really, what is the responsibility and role of our reverie now if we're going to work backwards through this poem? If bees are few, what is our reverie to the clover and the bee? And would it lead us to a prairie? So I think that's one prompt is just thinking backwards through this poem. If you wanted to write down in your notebook the phrase, if bees are few, and just imagine what that might bring you to, if that were the title of the poem. So I wanna just sit with that for a second. 
Um, if bees are few, I'm going to write it down in my notebook too. But I guess my next prompt had to do with the idea of this metonymy, of this idea that something that you might hold is the part of a wider whole and how its presence, if looked at carefully, implies a web of relationship that is really vast. And so I wanted to offer this opening prompt that we could spend a few minutes on right now, that you, wherever you are, find something that is of the non-human world. And, you know, actually, you could make that kind of vast because this is just like sand that's been heated and blown, you know, and this was a tree. So I don't know where the human and the non-human end, but here I have a piece of obsidian that I found um, on a urban beach in California. And I don't know if it came from the mountain range um, in Napa that's been a volcano. I mean, I know it was a volcano. This is a piece of volcano, like a hard, a hard volcano that's now like a little shard in my hands. But I guess I would just pick up something near you that's from the non-human world and ask it to tell you what whole it is a part of and see what it tells you. You're welcome to put some things in the chat if this is um, interesting and alive to you. Um, Somebody asked us to describe reverie, and that's a great one. Reverie being daydreaminess. So find pleasant daydreaminess. The kind of feeling that you might have looking out over a vast prairie. The feeling perhaps of being having the spaciousness inside yourself to daydream. So here. If you'd like to take a moment to find something and offer it your reverie and ask it what whole it is a part of, what would it tell you? ahead and ask the item a question. You might let it ask you a question and see what happens. Somebody in the chat said that reverie seems related to reverence. In fact, that was the meaning I took from the word, not literally accurate, but feels true. I think there is a kind of reverence in attentioning, in attention. And I love that comment. And I'm wondering about this idea of looking at things as part, 
as what as as connecting back to something larger that they're a part of and is that related to reverie that action of thinking about both the relationship between the part and the whole i love people putting poems in the chat I think that's my minutes, just about. So I get to pass the torch, yes? Those cool. were some gorgeous minutes indeed. Thank you, Tess. I've got some prompts in, in my own notebook um, and hope to uh, leave you all with at least a couple, couple more. Um, thanks also to Anna and to Carolina um, for the chance to share space and think for these poems, um, engage in this human, non-human uh, dialogue altogether. Thank you to the Emily Dickinson Museum um, for gathering us all, for all the hearts and hands that went into making Tell It Slant possible. And then thank you, all of you, for being here from New Orleans to New Braunfels, um, up to New York. I saw folks uh, chatting in from Argentina, from Brazil, um, and at least one poet chatting in from the humid gloom of Pittsburgh. Um, we are really, really glad you are uh, here. And I think that chat was a poem. Um, I'm gonna be looking um, at a Dickinson poem as well, which we're gonna read three times. Um, and I'll ask you at three different points to chat in some of your observations after I in introduce a couple of thoughts from um, thinkers who's, who's theory whose new materialisms helped me read Dickinson um, and helped me write in conversation with Dickinson, which is ultimately what I hope to be able to help you all do. Um, the poem that, uh, that I, I wanna read first um, is this one. Um, I, taste a lick, I taste a liquor never brewed. And for this first read through, you don't need to, attend to anything in particular. Um, I'll ask you, in fact, I'll just chat this in now so I can get it out of the way. I'll just ask you to chat in any words or phrases that stand out to you um, in the first read through, just based on where you are and how you are and you know your blood sugar and, and what's on your mind, what's in your ears right now. Whatever it is, just catch it and, and put it into the chat if you feel so comfortable um, uh, doing and um, and then we'll see what happens when I give you some other frames. So I'll read it for us. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not all the Frankfurt berries yield such an alcohol. Inebriate of air am I and debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler leaning against the sun. So I'll give you a moment just to see what popped for you in that first read through. And then I'll give you another moment to scroll through um, to see what other people are responding to. I'd love a glass of wine, I see. Inebriate of air am I. I read this as a bat. I love this. And in seeing what people are responding to, by the way, in this first uh, read through, I, I, I think I might be reading a different version, slightly different version. I'm gonna come back to the one on the screen. Um, in, in seeing what people are responding to, see if you can um, 
grok what might be going on there for them. Um, as you build a poem, you want them to react and respond to pretty powerfully um, as well. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. I'm go going to introduce now uh, just a paragraph. And I thought about including it in the slides and then I thought, no, let's actually, let's listen to this and I can chat it in so that you can read it afterwards if, if you'd like. But I'm gonna include a paragraph from Timothy Morton's Dark Ecology. Um, which is subtitled for a logic of future coexistence. And um, as I read this, um, you'll hear two terms, which we're actually gonna screen the poem in just a little bit um, for again. The first term is coexistence and the second word is collaboration. So here's Timothy Morton uh, from Dark Ecology. And a lot of like hands, fancy highfalutin words sort of coming from like a theory perspective, but don't worry, it'll get grounded and it'll help us return to this poem, read into it. Um, some of what I think is very much there and Dickinson um, can help us understand the way a few others can. Okay, here's Morton. The idea that humans began civilization in Mesopotamia is a retroactive positing if ever there was one. Humans looked back and designated the time of early agrologistics as a unit, justifying the present as if civilization had suddenly emerged like the goddess Athena from the head of the human without any support. Here's the good stuff. Without coexistence. Civilization was a long-term collaboration between humans and wheat, humans and rock, humans and soil. Okay, so we're gonna read the poem again. And as we do, I want you to tend to elements of coexistence or collaboration in the poem, and we'll see what we get out of this read. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not Frankfurt berries yield the scent such a delirious whirl. Inebriate of air am I in debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn the drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler come staggering toward the sun. Mm hmm. Yes, Joy. What else do you sense here on the coexistence, the speaker's coexistence, it would seem with all of these elements, human and non-human? What do you see here of collaboration among those elements or between the observer and what she is observing. Okay. One more input. This one will be from Jane Bennett. And then I'm going to give you a prompt and get you writing if I can. So I'm going to read one more piece, um, just a segment from Vibrant Matter, which is subtitled A Political Ecology of Things from the theorist Jane Bennett. And in it, early on, she asks, how would political responses to public problems change were we to take seriously the vitality of non-human bodies? By vitality, I mean the capacity of things, edibles, commodities, storms, metals, not, not only to impede or block the will and designs of humans, but also to act as quasi-agents or forces with trajectories, propensities, or tendencies of their own. My aspiration, Bennett writes, is to articulate a vibrant materiality that runs alongside and inside humans to see how a 
analyses of political events might change if we gave the force of things more due. So with that, we're gonna read the poem one last time. And then I want you to chat in what stands out to you in terms of the vitality or force of things Dickinson's drawing our attention to. Also, there's a lot of vitality and force just in this chat, which I hope the Dickinson Museum will allow us all to print and pilfer for our own poem making because there's a, there's a lot of good there. Okay, so in this read through with Bennett's frame in our minds, where do we see Dickinson lingering on the vitality, the force of things that are non-human? Last time through. I taste a liquor never brewed from tankards scooped in pearl. Not Frankfurt berries yield the sense, such a delirious world. Inebriate of air am I in debauchee of dew, reeling through endless summer days from inns of molten blue. When landlords turn a drunken bee out of the foxglove's door, when butterflies renounce their drams, I shall but drink the more. Till seraphs swing their snowy hats and saints to windows run to see the little tippler come staggering toward the sun. Feel free to chat in where you sense the vitality the most on this third run through if like me, you're getting something new each time. For some reason, it stands out to me that much more that Foxglove is capitalized and seraphs and saints or not. But there you are. Let me see what's standing out to you. The neighborliness of the tippler. The sun stands out. Good. I love this. Yeah, Frank, I love I love the line you pulled out and I'm still sort of teasing it out to the saints to windows run. There's something strange and wonderful about it all. Okay, so in a second, I'm going to give you a prompt. Um, and then just a couple minutes to jot down what comes immediately as you receive the prompt, um, knowing you're just gonna have to kind of put it in the notebook um, alongside Tess's and then uh, get ready for some more gorgeousness from um, Carolina. Um, I'll say before giving this to you that um, I right now am writing a series of poems um, in conversation with the Gowanus Canal of all places. Um, I think the Gowanus Canal is non-human. The deeper I get into the vitality and force of that thing and the things that float like beneath and on and all around that canal, I'm actually becoming <laughs> a little bit less sure. Um, but anyhow, I, I have found so much in Dickinson and Morton and Bennett and others that help me attend to the vitality of these things, the force of these things, their liveliness. Um, and the ways they might act upon each other, but also act upon the humans who are sensitive enough to pick up, let's say their frequencies um, and, and admire them in ways they wanna be admired. So I'm hopeful that your own dialogue with the non-human um, both adds to your everyday experience of the force of things around you. Um, and I hope you bring all those new perceptions into the poems you're writing on. Um, as a prompt, let me chat this in um, very simply, like consider using some of the words we encountered in uh, this last uh, poem. I pulled out pearl, endless, swing, windows, um, and sun, um, but I want you to pull out whatever um, feels most alive to you, and I want you to run with it, and um, if there's some way for you to get the poems you ultimately build out of this uh, to us, um, I would love to see them. So happy poem. 
And let me pass things on to Carolina to keep the conversation going. I feel so much like I am um, a torch bearer. <laughs> I am, um, there is so much vitality that is the operative word um, that you've passed on to me. I feel so grateful that I'm gathering here with each of you. Um, it's daunting to see the number of people in this virtual room, um, and I, I can't see anyone else but these lovely faces. Um, thank thanks so much for inviting me, everyone. Well, I um, would like to talk about the next poem. I think it must be the following one. Uh, keep going. <laughs> there we are. I decided to choose a poem that was, um, that I didn't know, um, that I didn't know very well, um, and so that I would feel a little uneasy working through it. Um, this poem, Under the Light Yet Under, um, <clears throat> I think um, first I want to say something about visiting Emily Dickinson's um, homestead closed at the time. Um, but this was very recently now that I live in Providence, I have um, easy recourse to Amherst, Massachusetts. And, um, but I decided with a dear friend to walk around the house to see what the garden was up to these days. Um, it was early enough where the hyacinth hadn't come in, but we saw all of the little um, placards for what would be growing in that area. Um, and seeing those plots of um, you know flowers and plants that hadn't grown in, there you just. I'm overcome with the sense of possibility and trying to inhabit um, that sense of possibility in Emily, who was such a, an avid gardener. Um, it's something I actually often do, which is to imagine um, what Emily on Main Street might have um, been surrounded by, might have been immersed in the, the soundscape, the smellscape. Um, of course, no motor cars are um, making up that smellscape, um, but there are certainly, you can imagine the stench of horses. They make up the traffic. The carriages make up the traffic and the soundscape. The pedestrians, the smell of horse shit, garbage, and flowering trees, and hyacinth, and lamp oils. Um, and partly why I try to do this kind of um, mental transport um, is the same when I'm overcome with the sense of animism. And I tried to imagine her um, similar sense of animism, which for me is this, um, to pick up another word that was mentioned, this reverence for, um, this reverence that's akin to attention, akin to daydreaming and akin to um, ultimately an awareness of how everything around you is alive, um, which I think easily can um, make us feel humble, a humility. Um, when I pass by a tree and recognize that it is alive as a human is, it contains in its smallest unit, um, that atom, that basic urge to survive and continue. Um, and to continue within a system, a kind of matrix of ecology. 
And so my friend and I, we um, walked around um, and tried to identify trees that might have been alive when Dickinson lived there. Um, and we tried to touch the trees and tried to, in some telepathic way through the fibers, <laughs> touch her, communicate with her through the trees. Um, it sounds kooky, um, but when poets get together, that's what happens. Um, and I think that this animism that I'm talking about, I'm always now looking for it in, in Emily and in Emily Dickinson's poems. Um, and in that gesture of touching the tree, I think um, what I am doing is to try to in some ways get rid of knowledge by acknowledging that the tree is alive. I'm trying to maybe think with my hand instead of what I know or what I um, notice about the tree, how old it might be, or if I know the name of the tree or some sort of taxonomic detail about it. I am trying to strip away that and just um, and be there. Um, and more importantly, it's something that I've tried to do in my neighborhood to, to think of these plants, these city trees as being neighbors as well. And so um, I tried to choose a poem that might revel in that, that kind of stripping away of knowledge or that kind of lower thinking, which is what I want to call it. So I'll read the poem. Under the light, yet under, under the grass and the dirt, under the beetle's cellar, under the clover's root, further than arm could stretch, were it giant long, further than sunshine could, were the day year long, over the light, yet over, over the arc of the bird, over the comet's chimney, over the cupid, the cubit's head, further than guess can gallop, further than riddle ride. Oh, for a disc to the distance between ourselves and the dead. The first thing that strikes me is this insistence on, rep on the prepositions and the repetition of under and further and over. And we also have between, um, and there is this kind of mental mapping that happens in Dickinson's world. Um, this kind of perimeter of um, where she is placing herself somewhere in the middle. I um, at the farthest reach, we have the space of the comet. We have um, the clover's root, and we are thinking of the world that lies under this. Um, so this is, um, we are going, sorry, we are going over. So we are going over the comet, somewhere beyond. And then we are going somewhere beyond past the clover's root. And so all the while she is, somehow making a kind of blankness for um, perhaps the speaker herself. Um, but I love this line, the, the cubit's head, over the cubit's head, this very weak measurement of the elbow to the wrist or the elbow to the, the tip of the finger. Like how many cubits does it take to reach beyond the comet's chimney? Um, I think that's uh, so 
brilliant how Emily Dickinson is trying to locate herself. We are trying to locate her, but um, there isn't a clear point where she, there is this, this eye seeing up and seeing down. Another thing about these prepositions is how it reaches me at this very subtle level of the, the, the sonic. Um, there is the O of over, 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 the O, which is, of course, inside wonder. It is the O, the utterance of, of pain, the O of um, delight or perplexity, confusion. And I think that it is all there, subtly being transmitted to us, um, this poem that's ultimately about this <clears throat> very um, nebulous relationship between the living and the dead. Um, how is that mapped out? We have the un, un, undoing of, of that knowledge. Um, and here's where I think the undoing of knowledge becomes a little more clear when she says, it is beyond, it is further than guess can gallop. It is beyond the poem. It is further than riddle ride. When she says, oh, for the disc to the distance, disc here, I think more primarily refers to the disc of a of a lens in a telescope, that thing which can bring the far away close, and in some ways the close far away. Sorry to ask how I'm doing on time because I failed to look. Can someone answer? Um, maybe a couple more minutes, Carolina. Okay. I didn't think that we would have time for um, a particular um, span for writing. However, I'd like to leave you with um, a prompt. Um, I want to say I want you to think about um, your own writing and to consider a particular subject or um, something in your most recent writing. And like this Dickinson, um, as she is um, thinking through, again, a relationship with death, I want you to think about that subject and choose a preposition that feels um, as though your work is being um, operated by that. It's your work. Are you inside the poem? Are you outside of it? Are you underneath the subject? Are you beneath the subject? Um, try to think. Put, place yourself in some kind of relationship with the subject and choose one or a set of prepositions. Um, the anaphora that she employs in this, I think, would make a very easy um, entry into the poem, an easy entrance into it um, to start you going. Thank you. I'd like to talk more about this later, um, but right now I'm going to hand the torch to Anna. Taking the torch from you, Carolina. Thank you for that. Um, I love, I loved all of that anaphora. There's something about the the momentum and the sort of come hither of anaphora. Um, it's just really beautiful. Um, 
So uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about another poem, one that's probably more familiar than any that we've looked at so far this evening. Um, but I want to sort of preface my talk um, by saying that um, I think that the thing that I most love about Dickinson um, is her status, her self as an interrupter. Um, she was an interrupter as a poet in writing um, po in a poetics that was so unlike anything that was happening during her lifetime. Um, she's an interrupter as a woman in living in a way that women were not supposed to live <laughs> um, during her time. Um, and she was an interrupter. Um, she she uh, attended Mount Holyoke College, um, which I have full disclosures, my alma mater as well. Um, and she was an interrupter there because she was famously named by Mary Lyon, the, the uh, leader and founder of Mount Holyoke College, a no hoper because she refused to be saved. So she was an interrupter in her in her beliefs and her belief system. And um, and that's why when I was thinking, what am I going to, you know, which poem am I going to write about here and talk about and think about more for this panel? I kept going back to when I heard a I heard a fly buzz when I died, um, a poem that I I think might have been the the one of the very first um, poems that I ever read of of Dickinson's and um, and it, it's because this poem um, sort of embraces the the her herself as an interrupter, um, and so that's. That's where I'm going to start with this little talk, um, which is maybe slightly more <laughs> um, more written out than than the sort of beautiful uh, musings that the rest of you have given, which I sort of I really envy you being able to to talk extemporaneously like that. Um, I'm going to just start by reading um, reading the poem. I heard a fly buzz when I died. The stillness in the room was like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. The eyes around had wrung them dry and breaths were gathering firm for that last onset when the king be witnessed in the room. I willed my keepsakes signed away what portion of me be assignable. And then it was there interposed a fly with blue, uncertain, stumbling buzz between the light and me. And then the windows failed, and then I could not see to see. I don't remember how old or where I was when I first came across this poem, but I do remember my first reaction, which was to giggle a little bit and then to stop myself and look around to see if anyone had heard me. Reading it now, I still have that giggle reaction, although at this stage, I don't mind if anyone hears me. Um, let's imagine this scene. The speaker is surrounded by loved ones who are piously waiting that king of kings, God, to enter the room, but she is far more interested in a fly, a wholly impious insect, one associated with filth and decay, and not just any fly, but one that buzzes that onomatopoetic word and sound that is equal parts irresistible to say and impossible to ignore, at least if one is in a room with it. We can imagine all of those somber mourners clenching their jaws and fists in an effort to resist taking a swing at the noisy, irreverent interloper whose presence is made only more emphatic by the stillness in the room. It's quite funny and not a little subversive to imagine a fly upstaging God, by just doing what a fly does, buzzing around, looking for food, regardless of who is in the way or what occasion it bungles into. And in this way, reaffirming that life with all its messiness and bodily hungers does indeed go on, just at the moment when all or almost all the humans in the room are focused on death, that last onset, and whatever judgment or revelation they hope might come with it. The extremity of the disconnect between the experience of Dickinson's speaker and the people surrounding her reminds me of the children in another poem that I recently read with my students, Auden's Museum 
creative arts. Uh, those children who, when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, did not specially want it to happen. And a few lines later in that po same poem, the poor torturer's horse that scratches its innocent behind on a tree. Perhaps the children of Auden's poem connects back to my initial giggling response to Dickinson's buzzing fly. Although I can't remember my exact age, I know I was young enough to accept that suspension of disbelief Dickinson's first line immediately requires of us. Our speaker is addressing us from beyond the grave. But I took that without question while also hearing a hint of swagger in the line, as if to say, I don't know about you, but I heard a fly buzz when I died. Coincidentally, my emphasis here mirrors the capitalized words in the line. But consider the difference in tone if the order of the phrase were reversed. When I died, I heard a fly buzz. This messes up the iambics um, in, uh, totally. But I also might argue that the perfect iambics of the hymn meter throughout the poem lighten the tone or keep it jaunting along. In any case, Helen Vendler in her reading of the poem also notes that the first line of the poem is out of order in terms of the chronology of the rest of the poem, which provides a pretty straightforward narrative of events, ending with that interposing fly. Discussing the poem in her Dickinson selected poems and commentary, Vendler observes that if it were narrated chronolog chronologically, Dickinson's poem would begin with line two, and the fly would appear where it belongs and where it now reappears in line 12. To me, this only heightens the potential for bravado in that opening salvo. By leading with the fly, and more importantly, the fly's buzz, before we get to any reference of death in, in that first line, Dickinson not only connects us physically to the experience by providing us with an image we'll all recognize, but she also neatly undercuts the gravity of our speaker's situation. Perhaps death isn't the great mystery after all. Perhaps it's just a somewhat annoying buzzing noise that we all eventually hear coming closer and closer. But do the others in the room and in the poem hear this buzzing? Another thing that strikes me now when I'm rereading the poem is how alone this speaker is. Notwithstanding my imagining of fly swatting mourners above, as far as we can tell from Dickinson's description of the events, the speaker is the only one who hears and then later sees the fly. None of the others interact with it at all. By the time the fly enters the scene, all the business of preparing for death has been completed. The keepsakes signed away, the eyes around wrung dry, breaths gathering firm. And where does this leave our speaker? engulfed in a stillness that is like the stillness in the air between the heaves of storm. Heaves, what a verb that is, suggesting weight and the heaving of sobs, the kind of crying that leaves you breathless, the muscles of your chest aching from having contracted and expanded too fast. Heaves frightens us because it suggests unpredictability, like heavy heaving sobs, heaves of storm and death might overtake you without any warning or preparation. And what is everyone else doing while our speaker is being buffeted in this way? Well, presumably a few of them are at least mentally totting up the keepsakes that have been signed away to them. And maybe another few are stewing over what hasn't been assigned to them. And the rest are gathering firm for the last onset when the king be witnessed. Perhaps this is slightly uncharitable of me, but it sounds as though there is a means to an end being observed here. The onset, the speaker's death, will bring God into the room so that the others can witness him. And uh, can witness him, and this is the main event, not what may befall the speaker that all the mourners are anticipating. Tellingly, in the interim, no one seems to be talking to the speaker or holding her hand or doing anything to comfort her as she prepares the portion of herself that isn't assignable to anything and anyone else for death. She's left all on her own to face this. Thank goodness for the fly, which, if nothing else, has impeccable comic timing as it interposes itself with blue, uncertain, stumbling buzz just when she needs a friend and confidant. Let's talk about the word interposed for a moment, meaning to come between two things or to inter intervene between parties. Our anti-heroic fly whose buzz in a wonderful moment of synesthesia is now 
blue, another assertion I accept without question and even feel that I can see now, perhaps it's a blue bottle fly. It is also uncertain and stumbling, sensations we might imagine one would feel in facing death. Crucially, the fly, like the speaker, is focused not on some imagined majesty of afterlife, but on the earthly light that remains in this one. In fact, this is why the speaker can see the fly. It has interposed itself between her and the windows, where we can imagine it, like billions of flies before and since, is stumbling and bashing itself against the glass in an attempt to escape the room. Is the speaker hoping for a similar escape? In typically elliptical fashion, Dickinson tells us that the windows failed, meaning perhaps that the speakers can no longer speaker can no longer make them out because her sight has failed. But let's pay attention to chronology again, because while she's been playing a bit fast and loose with what happened when elsewhere in the poem, here Dickinson is being almost redundantly clear. Then the windows failed, and then I could not see to see. So the windows failed before she wasn't able to see. Could that failure allude to them opening or breaking under the battering of that fly? Impossible, of course, but isn't it almost a relief to, ma to imagine our speaker flying out the window after her buzzing companion as a sort of alternative release to the one the others in the room are expecting? No kingly judgment needed. Speaker and fly are just going to buzz around together for eternity, seeing what they can see. After all, this is the same poet who told us in an earlier poem, faith is a fine invention when gentlemen can see, but microscopes are prudent in an emergency. Um, I read somewhere that she actually wrote that for Mary Lyon to explain her lack of faith, but um, that may not be exactly accurate. It's nice to think about though. Um, so this perhaps is what first drew me and keeps drawing me back into this poem. Dickinson, for all her writings on it and wondering about what might be beyond our world, never stops being and writing of it, of its stones, frogs, fields, and yes, flies. These are the things in which she delights resolutely and resplendently humane, even in their non-humanity. And in doing so delights us, leaving us space to laugh, even as she and we contemplate pain and storm and heaving loss. Like the speaker in this poem and like the fly, Dickinson keeps on looking at and stumbling against what is and kept on doing so until like the speaker of this poem, she could not see to see. Um, so I think I read that a little bit fast, but <laughs> I was worried about our time, but I wanted to just leave you in terms of interruption with, um, so an idea towards writing, um, which is that maybe you can try to write into and out of interruption. Consider a time when you were interrupted by someone or something while attempting to complete what seemed an, to be an important act. What do you remember of that interruption? How did it shift or change the scene or action you were involved in? Can you write from that moment of frustration, that moment of rupture, that moment of perhaps humor? Um, interruption often makes us laugh with its sort of incongruity and the juxtaposition that it can create. Um, and then the other way of embracing this um, is to be the fly, right, as the interrupter, um, at, or maybe as uh, the hummingbird in A Root of Evanescence, which is another poem that we have in our, our slide, slide reel here um, that I was going to think about and talk about too, but I got too hung up in, 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 uh, in, in my fly um, companionship. Um, but what does it feel like to be a disruptor? And, you know, can you embrace that and write from disruption? Um, I think that probably brings us close to the end of my time. So perhaps um, we should open things up for discussion. Am I getting that right? Yes, thank you so much, poets. Um, I wanna make sure everybody gets to see your faces there. Um, how fun to hear each of your approaches to these poems, some of which are so well known and well loved. And and yeah, Carolina, that was a poem I had not really fixed on before, even though I have personally sat through at least 10 Emily Dickinson poetry marathons. And so just <laughs> getting to hear uh, something new in that, um, very exciting. 
Um, let's see. So this is the time when we can take some questions. Um, while I catch up with the Q&A, I, I would maybe just invite you poets to check in with each other. Um, because I actually am not seeing any questions at the moment. So let's let's wait for those to come in because I know they're there. Um, head to your Q&A box, folks at home, and enter your enter your questions there. That was really fun. I wish I could just team teach with you all the days. <laughs> um and I kind of wanted to bring it back to this topic of dialogues with the non-human. Um, and, uh, you know, Anna, I can see where you saw that taking place. <laughs> um, I love the idea that we should speak to the non-human thing that interrupts us. Um, have you ever, ever done this yourself? Have you ever written into this prompt? That's why I guess I kind of wanted to ask that. Has anybody written to the prompt that they gave today? I think I'll I'll uh, say yes and no. <laughs> um, I've written um, I've I've embraced the idea of interrupting myself, um, but I don't think I've ever thought of it quite so distinctly. I don't think I've thought of writing as the interrupter. So I'm going to do that now. Yeah. Um, and another one of the comments was the idea that maybe the speakers in Julia's poem was a bat. I thought that was really interesting <laughs> yes. to imagine yeah. that maybe the speaker of these poems is non-human. That, mm -hmm. that, you know, I was thinking, we said, B, I'm expecting you, like she's speaking to the B. But maybe sometimes these unusual scenarios that she comes up with are 100%. in the voice of somebody else. 100%. And I think it was, it was Ruben in the chat that was saying, oddly, the presence of the non human, including potentially the speaker of the poem that I read, renders what's human in that poem so much more so. And I find that so fascinating, like the kind of human that could empathize and enter fully enough into a bat's experience, you know what I mean, in the space of the poem that I read. Um, is truly human indeed, which I, I find just very, very cool and and probably accurate. Um, ooh, I like this this point, Robin, about how B I'm expecting you is signed by yours, fly. Yeah. I've forgotten that. I mean, I wonder if there's a different prompt in there too, which is just to be more capacious about whose perspective you're writing from you know, and who could interrupt you and who who could be speaking to whom, you know? I it's just, I think that's I think that like that's a really interesting prompt that Dickinson is giving us on mass, you know. But I'm a little bit vamping because I'm hoping that somebody in the chat is going to oh Q and A here, there's more. Yeah, we've got some good <laughs> questions. Good. Oh, so okay. um so one, uh, so I know a couple folks are maybe hoping, and I think we could, let's save this for the very end. If at the very end, we could do a, a super quick recap of the prompts that you were offering. Um, and that, that'll be a good way for us to come to our close. But we've got some questions before then. So um, have you visited her homestead in Amherst, Massachusetts, also known as the Emily Dickinson Museum? And if so, has that connected you more intimately with the non-human speakers in her poems? We heard a little bit about that from you, Carolina, with the trees, and uh, curious to hear from the rest of you as well. Um, one of the things that's magical that the Emily Dickinson house has started to do, that's, it's a, it's a house that Literally, there were like professors living there, Amherst College professors living there, even in recent memory, when I was a student at Amherst College, that it was there, but, and I thought about Emily. I mean, I imagined her like charging past me on the way to her class, you know, I don't know why <laughs> it was like, we were both like young women trying to make it in this tough world. Um, and she companioned me in my heart, but she wasn't really so much in the house. And then the house has been able to expand its programming to 
you know, to do all kinds of wonderful things. If you have a chance in Amherst, you should visit. And one of the things that they do is they give writers sometimes an afternoon in the bedroom. And my afternoon in the bedroom, I had a lovely time there. I actually was really tired and I took a short nap on the floor. Um, but I also picked up um, one thing that's on the horizon, I think, is that a lot of the plant life that would have been around Dickinson's home is not really there now. There's just a, a, a process potentially beginning to reimagine her actual living world, which would have been much more like a front yard farm, um, like a little greenhouse space where um, things could be cultivated in the winter time. But there is a tree that drops large green nuts. And now I'm going to forget the name of the tree, even though I did know it at the time. And I picked up one of them and I imagined the seed pod as like an emissary from her moment to mine and that the tree was probably encapsulating both of our eras. And even if it wasn't exactly, I thought of trees as these kind of time travelers um, giving these very long um, extensions to the future. And somehow I was really able after my short nap on Emily Dickinson's floor to spend some time with the seed pod and um, you know, it's a very powerful place, actually, to go and look. And um, so much of the beautiful sky of Amherst is, I mean, there's a lot of noise in town, but there's a lot of natural beauty. Um, and and she's helped us see it. That's the other thing. It's not just that it's there. It's that she, her words help you greet almost every season that comes and that's such a gift, such a gift. Hmm. I'm I'm similar to you, uh, Tess, in that um, the house wasn't available to us when I was there um, as a student at Mount Holyoke. I felt Dickinson around me all the time. I mean, Mary Lyon is buried in the center of campus at Mount Holyoke. And so like her argument with Dickinson sort of felt very present to me as somebody studying Dickinson on that campus. But um, but I remember the house as being sort of shrouded in in um very dark bushes and you know it seeming like it was probably inhabited by a ghost, not professors, but <laughs> um so but I and I haven't had a chance to be there since the museum has opened. I don't I would love to read and to write in her room. So I don't know how you get on that list, but um, I'm just like, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I I want to come and see it, and um, I will. I think Brooke might have chatted the link for the studio sessions. Um, oh. So that's yet another reason to um, enjoy the riches of this chat. And I too am going to be signing up for one. Um, <laughs> I'm in Houston now, but I was in New York for a long time. And there was a thing that poets would do in terms of just day tripping up uh, to get a glimpse of the house, just to like literally be near it, <laughs> and even if we couldn't get in. Um, and I'll say that this might be apocryphal. I, I think that it's real. I'll say that like there was this feeling um among colleagues and friends that th there there was something potentially magical that was going to happen to you in that space. And naps are magical. So obviously Tess, Tess found what one of the, the many magical um, things you might find there. And just that feeling, like the connection you felt, like this tree was here when she was, and it's here as I, Tess, you know, walk the same space. I mean, that's, that's really powerful. Um, Apparently, Jory Graham went there at a really interesting moment of her pregnancy. Um, and I don't know exactly what happened in her experience in that house, but she speaks about it, you know, in podcasts or interviews and in profiles. And anyway, I, I don't, I think she went like for some kind of magic to uh, reveal itself to her. And she left believing that she'd be calling her daughter Emily. I don't know what else may have happened. Um, I know we're recording here if anybody wants to fact check this or fill out the profile, but anyway, 
there's some kind of magic there and it's not been lost on Jory Graham. So somebody, you know, has come away with it. Let's see. We have, thank you for that. <laughs> I, love, I love all of those um, anecdotes there. Uh, let's see. This is a great question from Kate, um, who says, I find the perspective in Dickinson's poetry to be overwhelmingly human, even when her speakers are keenly observing the more than human world. So how do you all approach that balance between speaker and subject, human and more than human? Hmm. I think that um, because the human is placed in this matrix with other beings, that's um, part of the gift when we recognize that. <laughs> it's sometimes not very obvious to us, even for those of us who've been training ourselves. Um, and I think that that's what... I find palpable in her work. She's never not going to be human. She is using um, a human language system. Um, of course, we're very awake to the ways in which the poem um, is going to break a lot of those boundaries and the ways that poems um, are trying to make sense by perhaps not taking away some of that sense. Um, However, when I'm, I can place her in that mesh of, um, of other beings where there's this kind of lateral relationship with these other beings, I think that that's when she seems most human, but also able to, um, to widen and inhabit these other, other creatures. What about you all? Humans, we have these imperfect bodies and imperfect consciousnesses, right? Apparently, another very intelligent being is the octopus. <laughs> and the octopus, it doesn't have a mind-body problem because its entire body is its brain. It is both a body and a brain all at once, you know. And we... I don't know what it would be like to have octopus consciousness. If there's a wonderful book about it by a guy named Peter Godfrey Smith, and it's called Other Minds, and it's really about being tr us trying to imagine something so other. And he writes beautifully also because we're coming up on this age of AI, which is going to be a different kind of otherness that we're dealing with all the time. Um. I think the playful way that she engages her humanness and allows herself to have this game of uh, this game and dance and imagination sort of um, disarms me. Um, I'm sure there's ways to critique her and I, I, I would, you know, we could do that too. But I, I just want to say that I, I, my sensation, my experience of these poems is of being finding new way pleasurable ways of access to feel in my human skin a connectivity outside my human skin and i just i mean that that's my experience of it and i also find it to be a permissive force that invites me to do that more so um anyway that that's one way of answering that question i read her really similarly and that playfulness, that acuity in her perception, that the strange magic um, of those M dashes and, and just what she's able to render so economically with such force um, makes me think, and I can tell like based on three sentences of what Anna shared in framing her poem that like, Anna, you know a lot more about Emily Dickinson than I do, but the little that I do know makes it strange that I'm about to use this phrase to describe her because I, I, um, I knew her to be somewhat um, introverted, um, but there's this insider's outsider-ness that she has. She's an insider as a human. That's a phrase that I'm borrowing from a theorist whose name I don't remember. So that'll uh, irritate me and I'll find it and I'll put it in the chat 
Um, I should I should remember it, but um, it's not there right now. But anyhow, what appeals to me about that phrasing based on what you just shared, Tess, is this sense that like she's human, so she's an insider in that way. But there was something in her deep introversion that, that had her kind of seeing human and non-human activity from the outside in a way. And that heightens this sense of observation and um, the eccentricity of what she's seeing and catching. That if she's in the mix, I don't think she's she's going to be able to do it maybe in the same way. I'm not saying she wasn't in the mix. I've, I've read some of those letters, so I know she's mixing. But um, <laughs> but anyway, that insider's outsiderness, I, I thought that for some reason that's like kind of, I'm feeling that in, in regards to her. I'll figure out whose words those are that I just borrowed. And I'll, I'll check them in. Yeah, I love that that idea of insider outsider. I I, I think that um, what convinces me in Dickinson's work um, in her connection to the non-human is that she is sort of resolutely non-hierarchical in her approach to everything around her like bees are just as important flies are just as important or maybe more important than god you know um you know that and 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 in uh tess is uh, the first poem that tess looked at you know that that trying to seed a field is as important as having a brilliant idea you know it's like all it's all on in the same plane here and um and i think that that makes her like a really generous um chronicler of the world and of human experience uh she just doesn't get hung up on what she's supposed to write about and what is supposed to be important to us and that's that keeps her alive to us i think that's one of the reasons why we still read her um because we're not sort of plugging into a, a belief system we're plugging into somebody who is just always engaging with anything that she comes across um, so yeah, I, I think that that's the way that she balances sort of being so human and at the same time writing convincingly with the not in this dialogue with non-humans. And I guess part of that is mm -hmm. what is human and what is not human is not a settled question for her. Mm, it's yeah. always unstable. And I think we would be really wise to keep that instability with us. You know, um, I, I think Brooke might have said this, but I'm just aware that if we're all going to share our prompts, we should probably do that now. Yeah. Um, I also noticed that some of the chats were going among panelists and some were going to the whole group. So um, I don't know if, if that can be aligned somehow, but I, there's so much great information. I mean, I, I'm just sort of like delighted and blown away by these conversation with, mm -hmm. with all of you. I love, I mean, what a cool group of people have come together tonight. <laughs> um, okay. My prompts were to just, if bees are few and maybe working backwards up that poem, towards reverie and towards dialogue. That was the kind of the idea. What if, you know, would there be a letter to Emily Dickinson and be like, these are few. But my other one had to do with the, using the figure of metonymy, which is this notion of part for the whole. You know, um, sometimes we can only see the, sm the smallest bit of something and yet we know that something large is there. And finding something from your world and that is non-human, although, again, that's a blurry line, and just having a conversation about what is the whole to which it belongs. And I brought out this little piece of obsidian because this was clearly once the center of the earth. And how what changes when you ask a thing? what whole it belongs to, what was it, how is it woven into the wider life of the world, and what happens if you have that conversation, um, which would involve a little bit of reverie. I didn't type it up neatly. I hope you follow that as a prompt, but that's my way of having th that conversation and to begin. Um, 
find your own little chunk and ask it. Julia, what were your prompts? I think that I just chatted my prompt to everyone and not just the hosts and panelists. Um, Y'all, I'm so sorry if I, if I was sending things directly to them. I thought that included everybody, but clearly not. So Brooke, when you send the recording out, um, maybe there's some way to get those references, especially to Morton and to Bennett and my goodness. Um, and then lots of loving on you all that I've been doing in the chat that I realize only seven of us have seen. Um, so... <laughs> You know, I don't Julia want to overwhelm you all again. I, I can funny. attest to that. Julia has been, <laughs> I'm in awe of how you've been able to do it. Uh, well, I've clearly not been able to do it because uh, because Diana A did not receive it. So uh, hopefully you, you know that it's there. Um, and yes, hopefully this prompt feeds uh, quite a lot of dialogues, human and non-human, or more than human. One of you used that phrase um, and, I, and I loved it. The more than human. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I love that. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. my prompts, one that was implicit was to um, visit your neighborhood trees um, and commune with it in a way um, that um, goes beyond a, a kind of ready knowledge of the tree touch the tree, hug the tree, um, and um, and have that conversation with it, ask it something, perceive a question that it might be asking you. Um, so it just takes some kind of attunement. Um, and then also search for a preposition that um, feels operative um, for you and write through it in an aphoristic way. Um, and in some ways you're going to be thinking about a particular subject that you're already working through, a project that you're writing um, and try to place yourself under it, over it, beside it. Um, think of the subject as having its, its own intelligence. And so what is the relationship there? Um, I, I just uh, copied and pasted my prompt into the chat, um, but it's uh, I wanted you all to write into and out of interruption. Um, consider a time when you were interrupted by someone or something while attempting to complete what seemed at the time an important act. What do you remember of the interruption? How did it shift or change the scene or action you were involved in? Try writing from that moment of interruption. Or conversely, write as the interrupter. Um, for this suggestion, I'm thinking of writing as the fly or as the hummingbird in a root of evanescence. What does it feel like to be a disruptor in this way? What does it achieve? And um, Sonia H said, I sense some activism in that. And um, yes, Sonia, you're right on. Yeah. <laughs> Let's all be interrupters. <laughs> Well, poets, that was just a phenomenal night with you. Thank you so much for being with us and for your um, insights into Dickinson's human and non-human considerations. Um, what an energizing and inspiring night. And thank you to be with, uh, thank you for being with all of you listeners at home and for all of your engagement. Um, we hope that you will head to the websites for each of these poets and learn more about them and their work and buy their books because they are fabulous. Um, so thank you again to Anna B.Q. Ross, Carolina Abade, Julia Gez, and Ted Taylor. And remember that the Tell It Slant Poetry Festival continues now through Sunday, bringing you so much more poetry and fun. And we hope that you'll join in for some of those other events. Uh, coming up tomorrow, we're bringing you uh, more of the Emily Dickinson Marathon. I know there are some readers in the, in the, in the room with us tonight, um, and we'll see you there tomorrow. We will also have a really wonderful reading at 6 p.m. Eastern time tomorrow. It's our festival edition of the Phosphorescent Poetry Series. So we're bringing you Pulitzer Prize winning poet Diane Seuss, Jane Huffman, and Molly Aiken. You don't want to miss that. 
And as a reminder, we at the Emily Dickinson Museum are thrilled to provide you with our free programs like this one, but we can't do it without your support. So if you would like to make a donation, you can do so at the link in the chat. And uh, again, thank you so much, poets. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you.